Well, good morning. Welcome again this uh, wonderful Sunday morning. Uh, extremely hot, isn't it? Um, amazing. My sister who lives in uh, up on Upland or West Covina, somewhere over in there, she texted me last night. She said, I thought we moved out of Bakersfield. And, and I said, yeah, we did. And I had called my dad yesterday and mom and was talking. I said, so are you guys burning up? Because I, I, it was 111 uh, here. And so I figured that they were, and my dad said, it's not bad. It's, it's about 100. I'm like, what? When is Bakersfield ever cooler than here? But it, it was yesterday. Uh, but they're supposed to hit the same temperatures as we are today. So um, anyways. But this was my world growing up. This, is, this was normal, right? Well, maybe not quite this hot, but it was hot. Uh, this morning is actually the second lesson of a series I started on Wednesday night, which is odd because I know most people here on Sundays aren't part of our Wednesday night Bible study. But I wanted to do a study on how to study the Bible. And this series, you can do either lesson one or two um, in either order. So if you weren't on the, the Zoom call on Wednesday night, I want to encourage you to go to our YouTube page. I sent out an email link last night or yesterday sometime and a text. Uh, follow that link and watch that uh, link or that video and just encourage you to do that. Um, and then uh, for those who uh, were there and not here today, they can watch this one. Uh, but my goal is that we would all hear these two lessons uh, on how to study the Bible. And the reason that I chose to do this study was because of what I'm asking us to do on, as a church. Specifically Wednesday nights, we're going to be discussing these things. But on, um, I'm hoping even for those who can't be part of the discussion, that you would be part of reading through the New Testament together. Uh, God has done such a wonderful, miraculous thing for us through giving His Son and dying on the cross and forgiving us of our sins that we are able to um, have that relationship with Him. That we can be forgiven of our sins by just putting our belief in Him. Right? He came and died because we had been separated from Him because of our sin. Yet He comes and He says, I want to pay a price that will make you clean, that will make you right in the eyes of God. Now, it doesn't mean we'll be perfect. doesn't mean we'll never mess up. And we'll, 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 Sure, we're going to mess up. We'll make mistakes. We'll do some things. But God forgives us, and He's walking with us. And as long as we pick ourselves back up and we keep walking along and following Him, He's right there with us. And, and so that is such an important thing. And, and hopefully everyone here today has, has heard that story, heard about His love, and, and has accepted that. Because it's just an easy thing to accept. It's believing in Him. And when we believe, our belief moves to action and we start wanting to learn about who he is and change. And, and the big, one of the big ways we do that is we come to church and we go to Bible studies and, and we have people who know the Bible and have studied the Bible a little bit longer. They can then share that with us and they teach us. And that's good. But that should never be our only source of growing and learning and studying the Word of God. It should never just be by itself or, on, or, or sorry, on just Sunday mornings or just on Wednesday nights. And I fear that that happens to many Christians, people who come and they put their faith and they say, you know what, I'm going to become a follower of Christ. That they just get into this, this rut of going, I'm going to go and learn on Sunday and then I'll go again next Sunday and then I'll go the next Sunday. And, and that's just not the best way of learning. I mean, think about it. When you were in school, how many days a week did you go to school? Five, right? How many hours were you in class studying those subjects? Six, seven? So you're, you're putting in hours a week to learn those different subjects and study and, and, and things like that. When you went to work, wherever you work, whatever job you have, when you started there, they didn't just say, you know what, show up once a week for an hour or two and we'll show you a little bit and expect you to be able to do everything. No, you, often you have an orientation and and then maybe a, a probation time, of training time, it might be a couple days, it might be a few weeks or months, depending on, on what type of work you're doing and what type of skill set it demands. But it's a daily thing. It's, it's, why? Because that's the way we were created. We were created to 
learned a little bit at a time and, and repetition, alpha repetition. But the further apart the repetition is, the less likely we are to learn that and develop it. We need it regular. We need to be in it and practicing and, and whatever it is. And I always have to come back to the sports world, baseball. Right? For me, we, we practiced every day. You took hundreds of swings off of a tee and the pitching and this and that. Why? Because you needed that repetition. But if you only practice once a week, you were not going to develop. As coaches, and we would often tell, don't just practice here, but you need to practice at home on the weekends, especially with Little League when you only could have them twice a week. Hey, you guys need to be practicing on your own too. Because there's this, there, we need to be into things regularly. And so my goal for us as a, as a church is that we would all be in the Bible ourselves regularly, daily, reading it and, and studying it and taking out what we need from it that we can learn to become who God's created us to be. Because right, we were all created, mankind was created, and then they cho man chose the sin, and then that caused the separation. And Jesus died so we could be forgiven our sins, made righteous in him, and then our journey begins trying to get back and become what God created us to be. And it's a lifelong journey. And so over the last several weeks, I've been encouraging you guys, if you don't already have the YouVersion Bible app on your phone, to download that on your phone. And, and together we would start going through the, uh, the, the plan for um, reading the New Testament in a year which is about five chapters a week. It is. It's five chapters a week. And we were going to do that together. And so you don't have to have the Bible app. Some of you I know still don't use the, the smartphones and do some of that, and that's okay. We have, I have a couple left where we've printed out that devotional for you. Or it's just going to be in the back of the bulletin what chapters we're doing each week. And so last week we started on Monday. We did chapters 1 through 5 of Matthew. And then tomorrow we'll start chapter 6 through 10. But we'll do chapter 6 Monday and, and so forth. My, on Wednesday night at Bible study, we will discuss chapters 1 through 5. And the idea behind that is everybody is reading and studying it, and they're highlighting things. They go, you know what, this really stood out and was important to me, and I, I thought this was cool. Or I didn't understand this. What did this mean? Or why did Jesus do that? Or why did they do And we'll ask questions of the text. Uh, and then when we get together on, on Wednesday night, I want to open it up for discussion. And people can share things like, um, <clears throat> thank you. That people could share things like um, what stood out to them. Because I can almost guarantee you're going to see stuff you've never seen before. Uh, as we read carefully, and pay, it, just about every time through when I read, I see stuff like, oh, I didn't notice that because it stands out. And, and so hopefully we'll all be doing that and we'll start that up on Wednesday. Um, but at the same time, I thought this, this is a good time to just kind of take a couple lessons and talk about how do we study the Bible? How do I come up with those questions and how do we do it? And on Wednesday night, we started out talking about um, our heart our reasoning. Why are we reading the Bible? And so you can watch that video on, on YouTube, uh, but essentially it comes down to our, our motive. What is our motive? Why are we reading the Bible? Why do we want to read? Are we reading the Bible just because um, we feel guilty? Because everyone talks about it's so important to read the Bible, so just, oh, well, I guess it's obligation, and if I don't, oh, I feel bad. If people say, how much do you read your Bible? And I have to say no. So I just kind of read it. And so we just start reading it, and we just read it through the motions. Well, my goal for us is that we would get to the point that we want to read the Bible and it would just become alive for us and, and things like that. So that's what we're going to talk about today. And uh, or we talked about on Wednesday and and we're going to talk about it more today. Let me get a drink of this water. All right. <clears throat> the first point here, studying the Bible devotionally. We should read the words devotionally. In other words, we should be devoted to them. The Bible does tell us we are all, 
We are all to use it to teach others, right? We're, we're supposed to use the Bible to teach other people. Uh, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. How do we go about doing these things? And this is, I think, specifically talking about as we interact with one another. Right? I, there is a different way of communicating, I believe, with people who aren't Christians and people who are Christians. Right? Um, we, cor- we should correct one another, but we should teach people who don't know. And, and show them, you know, this is the right way. So um, I will interact with my kids differently. We're at the park doing something and I see uh, a kid being crazy or whatever. I don't go and spank their butt. All right. But my kid doing that behavior, I might. Now, I might say, hey, you OK or whatever and get the attention of a parent. I might do something to bring attention to that behavior or, or try to change it, especially if they are threatening other kids because they're throwing sand in their eyes or something, you know. I might say, hey, hey, don't do that, don't do that. That's not, that's not nice. But if it was my kid doing that, what are you doing? You know better. All right, that, and the difference is like it's correction and knowing in our relationship. And so inside the church, we are to be correcting and, and pointing out stuff a little bit differently. But to our non-Christian friends, we want to say, hey, look, this is what we believe, and this is why I believe, and I think this is why this is not right, and this is the impact of doing, making that decision, and things like that. But it's important when we're doing that, that it is biblically based. And if it's not biblically based, um, then we're off. But how do we know if it's biblically based if we don't know the Bible? If we're not reading it, if we're not studying it, if we're not engaged in it. And so that, that verse, hey, it's God-breathed and it's useful for teaching. Yeah, we can teach people who don't know. Rebuking. When we see each other doing stuff they shouldn't be, we can rebuke and correct. And, and then it can help us to train people towards becoming what God wants them to do. But we need to know it and understand it. Second is uh, prayer and understanding as we do our Bible reading. We often talk, often talk about reading the Bible and we talk about praying, but we don't often talk about reading the Bible and praying together. At least I don't, or I haven't. It is one thing to take the Bible and read it and analyze what it, is, it with study guides and commentaries and another uh, to prayerfully read it. We will discuss studying through it academically, but in, in more detail in a little bit this morning. But to study academically uh, without dependence on the Holy Spirit or prayerfully um, isn't our goal. We want we want to read with the Spirit. We want to read in prayerful and interacting and talking and hearing what it has to say. Academically studying can become a mentally um, a mentality of self-reliance. We're just reading. We're not really paying attention to what the Spirit is telling and pointing out to us, and we just kind of read through it. Um, and then we start to read with human wisdom versus the wisdom of God. Paul wrote with, in regards to this subject, 1 Corinthians 2, verses 19 and 14. However, as it is written, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, No mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love Him. But God has revealed it to us by His Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even deep things of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the man's spirit within him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. We have have not received the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, expressing spiritual truths and spiritual words. The man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, 
for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. So there is some understanding as we read the Word that will only come as we prayerfully interact with the Holy Spirit and He touches and He guides and He interacts with us. And He'll show us things. Um, Dependence on God is in our thinking is a fundamental aspect of being human. It was even before the fall. When Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden, they needed God to tell them what to do. God talked to them. He interacted. Hey, name the animals. Do this, do that, right? God interacted. God talked to them and led them. Romans um, Part of what it means to be human is that we depend on the revelation from God in order to understand our existence. And this dependence only intensified after the fall. Romans 1.21 says, For although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God nor gave thanks to Him. But their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. This means we naturally stray from God morally, but in addition to that, our minds are trained by sin. We no longer think the way we ought to think. Uh, And this is why prayer is absolutely essential to Bible study. If the Bible is God's word, then understanding the Bible means understanding the mind of God. Um, The scriptures are full of wisdom of God, and we are absolutely dependent on the Spirit to reveal that wisdom uh, to us and establish in our lives. And so I, I have started practicing that just very very regularly doing it recently. And it has been, I think, some of the best time in reading the scriptures that I've had in years. Um, It's just, I don't even know how to to demonstrate it, but as I I read the text, I'm I'm talking back. And I'm, and I'm praying, and, God, and, and I see some things that I hadn't seen before, and, and I'll just, God, help me to do that. Help me to do this. Um, um, I was going to see if I could. There was something I read yesterday. I was going to see if it would stand out to me real quick here. Um, no. All right, I'll move on. But, but just as I read, I, I, pray, I pray and I say, I see the, what the characters that they're writing about, the authors are writing about, and, I, and I'll just say, God, help me not to be like that person because there'll be people doing negative things. Or God, help me to do this. And, and it just... All of a sudden, he'll, he'll show me something. I'll say, that, that is something you need to try to do. And that's what I was going to try to examine. But I, I, it just slipped my mind right now what it was. But um, it's, just, it's, it's just been different. And I, I, all I can say is been, try it. <laughs> I don't know how to explain it any more than that. But try it. Um, third, study the Bible obediently. Too many Christians study the Word of God as it is uh, gaining knowledge is the sum total of our mission on this earth. Right? We just we read, I want to gain knowledge, and even what I've been talking about, it sounds like that. I want to understand it. I want to gain knowledge. But there's so much more to really studying the Bible than just gaining knowledge. See, there are some biblical scholars who know the Bible better than you and I ever will. They've spent their life just reading this book and, and finding what it has to say, but the thing is, they don't believe it. They're just studying some book that people have written that, that religious people study and read, and, and it doesn't mean much to them. They're not reading with the Holy Spirit. They're not reading prayerfully. They, they're that. It's just they want to understand uh, culture, right? It's sociology. It's it, the study of people who go to church and what their beliefs are or whatever it might be. And so they, they know it. They know what the things say, but they don't get it. They don't grasp it. And see, the idea behind studying the Bible is to study it obediently. That we get the knowledge, but then we do what that knowledge tells us to do. 
According to Paul, knowledge can be completely worthless and even harmful because knowledge can puff up, but love builds up. In 1 Corinthians 8.18, we know that we all possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Right? Knowing what this is, but then having the love of God in us teaches us how to distribute it, how to show love, how to live it out. If we are not putting what we know to work in our lives, then our knowledge will simply make us more arrogant. That does not mean we should study less, because that would be, that. well, I just won't study the Bible. If I don't know more, I won't be there. No, that's not what it means. Instead, we should be learning everything we can and immediately applying it. The Bible is filled with God's commands, and you probably already know some of the things that He clearly wants us to do. Start there. Pray, obey, and begin enjoying the peace that comes from studying the Bible obediently. You know, and, and you know, I've heard people talk about they're reading through and they'll get to a certain area and they just have to keep reading that same thing because they don't get it. And they're trying to figure it out or they're trying to apply it. And they'll just kind of keep studying that same section for a, a season until they get it into their life. We, just, we, we want to do that. Um, we want to do that. Studying with faith. Um, I love this word faith. As I've been reading through this last month or so, I've, I've been underlining the word faith. And that word faith is powerful. Because it comes up in so many things. Because of faith, people are healed. Their faith, not because of Jesus' faith. Because of people's faith or their belief, we're saved. Um, faith is this powerful thing that we want to develop in our life. Studying with faith is really connected to the obediently. It is the faith of knowing God said to do, and this is and stepping out and living it out. Right? That's one thing to know what to do, but to step out and do it is a whole other thing. And that's where the faith comes in. Right? I am going to do this in faith. I don't understand why I should go and say I'm sorry. I don't understand why I should forgive that person who should who completely hurt me and wronged me and did those things to me. But Jesus teaches to do both of those things, to apologize and to forget uh, and yeah, forgive. Well, how's that going to help me? I don't know, but let's try it. And one of the things I've learned is I step out in faith and I try to do the things that the Word tells me. It works out pretty good. Works out. They don't always accept my apology. Um, they may not forgive me, but that's not my responsibility. My responsibility is to, to say I'm sorry. And, and there's just power in that. And there's been secular studies about people that have... Uh, unforgiveness in their heart and just or forgiveness and they their studies show that it's bad for your health um, bitterness and unforgiveness it, it literally eats at people and can make them sick we read the bible but we don't act as if we believe what it says Right? We read what's best for us, what God tells us, but we don't apply that. We read about judgment for those who deny Jesus, but it doesn't change the way we reach out for people around us. Right? When we read that and we start hearing about, you know, those who don't come to know Jesus, who don't accept His love and what He did on the cross, they have eternity without Him. Eternity in hell. Eternity in separation from God. That should motivate us in our faith to step out and say, hey, Jesus loves you. Jesus died for you. This raises the question, do we really believe or have faith in what God has said? Another example is when we read God's grace. The Bible is clear about it, um, that God forgives. In 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all of our unrighteousness. This is just one of the passages that teaches us this. Yet many of us walk around with doubt, questioning our, our salvation, 
Questioning if he really loved me. Did he really forgive me? Is he really making me righteous? If he really did, then why do I keep messing up? Why doesn't he just take away this temptation and these desires? And, and, and we just kind of doubt this. And that We're not moving in faith that he just forgives us and will purify us from all unrighteousness. He knows we're going to slip up and mess up, but he forgives us. And, and we see that example in the Bible. And Peter always jumps right into my mind. Peter denies even knowing Jesus three times. Three times he's like, hey, aren't you, one of, aren't you one of his disciples? Were you with him? No, 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 I don't know that guy. No, I think you are. Nope, not me. Third time. No, not me. And he, he's denying even knew him. A few days later, he's interacting with Jesus. And Jesus says, you love me? Yeah, you know I love you. See, God knows that we love him, our heart. He knows that we love him. And go feed my sheep. Go be obedient. I need you to go tell people about me. I need you to let people know and grow. Go tell them. And he says that back to, to him three times. He forgave him and he embraced him and he gave him mission. And if that was the last time Peter ever messed up, then that would be one thing, but it wasn't. We later told it by Paul. The apostle goes, hey, I've confronted Peter about the way he acts when uh, his Jewish buddies are around and Gentiles are there. When his Jewish buddies aren't there, he interacts with Gentiles and everything, but when they get there, he kind of shuns them. And that's not right. And I've, and I've talked... So even later in his life, he's still doing some things that's not right and needed correction. And so that's going to be... We're going to be on that way. That doesn't mean God hasn't forgiven us. That doesn't mean that God hasn't... Um, isn't walking with us. Now, if we take that as a pass to say, well, then I'll just do whatever I want to do because God just... Re when, when now that's a heart issue and you're not putting an effort and God sees that and He will counter... or Then we can walk away. And so, a heart issue that we're having faith, we're reading the Bible with faith and we're applying it to our lives. Um... The Bible transforma and transformation, truth of the matter, all Bible studies should lead to transformation, which is what we've really been talking about, having faith, being obedient. Uh, six, studying logically, uh, or what I called earlier academically. Kind of studying it like a, a history book or studying it as you would in class or school or things like that. Um, we are commanded to do that as well in the Bible. 2 Timothy 2.15 Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. So we are to know the truth and handle it and study it and be involved in it and, and get to know it. And we're told to do our best. We are studying the very words that God chose to communicate to us. So in addition to studying prayerfully and obediently, we must study diligently. It is good for us to keep in mind some general principles for interpreting Scripture. Every text belongs in a context. Every chapter, paragraph, sentence, and word derives meaning from its relationship to the words, sentences, paragraphs, and chapters around it. Um, think about the word read or read, R-E-A-D. I like to read books. Have you read the story? It's the same word written in the same way, but its context, the words around it, changes its meaning. Right? Um, read means past tense. You've already read. Read. I like to do that ongoing. And so context changes everything. I remember someone putting up on the board once. I can remember the sentence. I um, can't remember what the sentence was exactly, but it was the comma. The commas were in different place. And it had something to do with like I, um, liking to eat something. Like, and they had a person saying, huh? That's what? Oh, let's eat grandma. If you put the, if you put the comma in the wrong place, it's saying, it, it's saying, hey, let's eat grandma. Let's eat grandma for dinner, right? 
But if you put the comma in somewhere else or leave it out or add it in, I guess, let's eat, Grandma. Like, let's eat, Grandma. Come on, come on, let's go eat. Same sentence, but punctuation changes things totally. And sometimes people do that with the Bible. It's a sentence and it means one thing and it's kind of powerful, but then we like that, but then when you put it into the context, that's not really what it meant. And I used this on Wednesday night. I'll use it again. I told a, a story about a guy who really wanted to hear from God, so he took his Bible and he, he just flipped it open and he pointed at something and he read the verse that he finger pointed at and it said, and Judas hung himself. Well, that's weird. So he flips it through the pages and he puts his finger on another verse and it says, and go do likewise. Uh, completely out of context. Both of those phrases are in the Bible. But by themselves and individually. And, put, and people do that with the Bible. Um, we don't want to do that with the Bible. We don't want to put our own um, spin on things. No, the difference between interpretation and application Maybe the most common mistake made in Bible interpretation is when people focus too much on what this verse means to me. These type of interpretations in the very, are they, they are heavily influenced by opinion and desire. So we always have to be careful of that. That we're not making this say what we want it to say. Because we can do that. The focus becomes what we think the verse means rather than what God is saying to us through His Word. If not careful, we can develop the assumption that the Bible has personalized meaning for each Christian. It might mean one thing to me, but another thing to you, and that's not the case. God has one meaning, one purpose. Many biblical passages have uh, nuances of meaning, and you might notice something that others miss. It is important to understand that the Bible means what God intends for it to mean. Sometimes when we talk about what this passage means to me, we are actually talking about application rather than interpretation. With interpretation, we are asking, what does this mean? With application, we are asking, how do I apply this meaning to my life? An example, Matthew 22, um, 39 says, Love your neighbor as yourself. Obvious interpretation is to love people. That's your interpretation. But how do we apply that to our life can be totally different. How am I going to show love to different people? To my neighbor, to my kids, to that. There are thousands of ways that we can express love to one another. But that verse only means one thing, to love others. Um, find the plain meaning. We need to learn to take the Scripture's face value. While some sections of the Bible are difficult to understand, so much of the Bible is easily understood. When we read that those who are in the flesh cannot please God, Romans 8.8, 8, we will have to be careful to study the verse as in its context to decide what it means to be in the flesh. But the plain meaning of the verse is clear. God does not want us to be in the flesh. Uh, story Exodus... or. Uh, and Moses and the Israelites go into a war against Amalek. Exodus 17, 11. As long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amaleks were winning. Some interpret this to mean that we must keep our hands and our hearts pointed towards heaven if we are going to defeat our spiritual enemies. While that may be true, there is no indication that this is what God is telling us through this passage. If we're going to take this verse at face value, we will read it as a description of a un, the unusual way in which God and Moses to lead Israel to victory in a historical battle over the Amaleks. Through the story, we can gain insight into the power of God and His ability to save His people. But those insights do not change the clear meaning of what God recorded in Exodus 17. Um, take the Bible literally. When we examine each word, verse, chapter, and book, we need to allow the context to suggest whether that verse should be taken as literal statement, rhetorical question, a figure of speech, etc. Uh, for instance, when Jesus talks about if your eye makes you sin, go gouge your eye out. Is that literally or rhetoric? We, we, we kind of want to figure that out. Is he making a strong statement to say how important it is to do whatever it takes 
to keep your eye from making you sin or whatever body part that might be. Um, accepting the Bible as literal truth does not mean that we interpret every passage literally. Many places it uses metaphors, parables, poems, extreme statements to make a point. Um, take God's word at face value and do what he tells you to do. Study the historical context. Historical settings of a passage will often shed light on what the passage means. May need outside resources such as Bible study, or sorry, a study Bible, a Bible dictionary, or commentaries. Um, these are just different types of books that give you more examples. A study Bible has a few notes on the bottom of each page. Uh, a, um, a commentary is a lot of detail. A separate book that tells you and explains what's happening and will give you history and context and different things that's going on. An example of how context can change the meaning. In Jeremiah 29, 11, a verse that's often quoted, we, we've uh, probably all have used it at some point, or a lot of us have. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Uh, people love this because they interpret it as God saying, He will keep us from harm. Right? And he'll bless us. But is that really what Jeremiah intended to communicate to us? If we look at the historical context of that passage, we find that Jeremiah was writing to Jewish exiles in Babylon. They had gone into captivity and punished as punishment for their lack of faithfulness to God. Jeremiah told them that they would be in captivity for 70 years so that they should settle in and seek a, to bless Babylon while they were there. And then comes Jeremiah 29, 11. God promised that he um, did indeed have a plan for his people and he would restore them to the land of Israel after their days of exile were over. So basically it's saying, you're grounded, but when your grounding is over, then you can do things again. Right? Yeah, you're grounded. You can't go out this weekend. But when that's over, you can get to go out next weekend. So the verse doesn't say there's not things aren't going to be bad. There's not going to be tough days. You're not going to get punished. There's going to be. But stay faithful in the times of those, and there's going to be a time of blessing as well. The historical context reveals that Jeremiah 29, 11 is not a blank check promise from God that nothing bad will ever happen to us. Um, let go of your baggage when we come to read. And we're just about done here. Let go of your baggage. Life experiences can also taint the way we read the Bible. Those abandoned and abused by their fathers may struggle more to understand what the Bible says about a loving Heavenly Father. I've met people that way. They didn't have a good heavenly, or a earthly father. And they had a really hard time accepting God as their Heavenly Father. Well, Because their, their picture, their model of what a father was, was um, messed up. And so we have to learn to say, you know what, yeah, though I didn't have a good example of a father, I have to put that to the side and recognize that God um, is really what a father is supposed to be. Or maybe those who were raised with few, rule, few rules and weak parents may have had a hard time seeing the power and sovereignty of God. They were just used, there's not any rule, there's no guidelines. You can just come in and go as you want, do what you want. They, the parents almost seem like they don't care. And so people then come to the Bible and go, well, this is so restrictive and this and that. And, and as I say often, as I, we talk about it, it's not restrictive, it's freeing. When we apply the things of the Bible, it really is freeing. But it doesn't look like that first. So we need to learn to set our things to the side and apply it to our life. Um, our experiences have an impact on our desires, which in turn affect our interpretations. When we read the Bible, we need to do everything we can to avoid making assumptions about what the Bible is saying. We need to let it speak for itself. We are all tainted by the commitments and assumptions of our culture. That's the other thing. When we don't understand the culture, where the Bible is coming from, and we try to apply 
biblical things to American culture, it doesn't always mesh. Um, some of the teachings there, it, it, there, there's some cultural things. Um, that's why some of the commentaries are so good, especially when some of the cultural things, like when you read the parables that Jesus talks about, a lot of farming and things like that. Well, we're not familiar with farming for the most part. And so understanding what he's saying about farming <clears throat> makes a lot more sense when we just come to applying to our life. We also have been heavily affected by our life experience, but the more we let go of our baggage and ask God to speak directly to us through his word, the more we will find God's truth transforming our minds and actions, and the better we will understand the mind of God. And then lastly, seven, application. Accurately interpreting the Bible is not the final step. The purpose of reading and interpreting the Bible is obedience and fellowship with God. If we interpret the scriptures perfectly yet fail to live in accordance with what we read, we are fooling ourselves. James 1.22, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive ourselves. Do what it says. Do what it says. Now, I said at the beginning that believing in Jesus is all as it takes to be forgiven of our sins. But you really can't replace, or sorry, some people will say it's doing. Well, you've got to do things. If you do this, do that, and this, then you will be made right in God's eyes. And the truth is, believing saves us, but the doing, they're, they're connected. When we truly believe in God and what he did, we want to do what he wants us to do. It starts to impact how we decide things. And so this morning, I just wanted to kind of run through that. Not a typical Sunday morning message. But I wanted to run through that and encourage you that we would all be reading our Bibles and learning what God has for us and, and talking to God ourselves. Think back to grade school, junior high. And you'd tell your buddy, hey, go ask her if she likes me. And he'd go over, do you like it? And then come, no, you're ugly. Well, that's what I got. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But, but we, see, we did that, right? We would send someone over to ask, the other, and then we'll tell them this, and tell them that, tell them that. And, and we had this middle person. If that's how you continue to date into adulthood, it's probably not going to go far. I can... You need to communicate with that person as well. Now, someone introducing you to someone, hey, this is my friend, this and that. Oh, hey, how are you? And then some... that's one thing. And that's a good thing. But if you continue to say, just, I just want to talk through this person, that's going to go nowhere. And I believe for us, if we really want to grow in faith and we want to become the people God wants us to be, and I think we need to become the people God wants us to be to become the church He wants us to be, we need to have a one-on-one -on -one time with Him. We need to be dedicated. We can't just rely on the pastor or Sunday school teachers or Wednesday night Bible teachers Telling us what God wants us to tell. That's important. We need that. It's part of the growing and teaching process. But we also need to be diving in ourselves. Studying ourselves. The scriptures tells us over several times to watch out for wolves in sheep clothing. There are pastors out there that will immerse, interpret, and mislead people. We've heard stories. The best way to protect yourself from that is that you're reading this and knowing it because you'll go, huh, that ain't right. And if we come with the Spirit of God in us, the Spirit will say, hey, that's not right. Hopefully you never have a pastor that's that way. However, sometimes unintentionally, pastors are human and they might misread something or, or have, some, oh, I think that says this and it's a point they've been wanting to make and they'll, and, and, that could happen to me. I hope it doesn't. I try not to do that. And if I do, I hope you can catch it and correct me. 
Because that's living life together. I don't want any of us to be dependent on a leader. I want us all to get to the point that if the whole world fell apart, I could lead my family. We could have church service in my home. I could start a church in my home for my neighborhood because I would know how to study the word and I would know how to tell people and, it would, and God could, could like, we need to be that way. Even if the world never falls apart, we just need to really know Jesus. We just really need to know Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your love. We thank you that you came and you died for us. And Lord, I pray that you would just help us to just remember that and embrace that. And Lord, that we would want to know you better and better, that we would want to hear from you, we want to talk to you, we want to interact with you, uh, that we might even want to debate with you. (laughs) Because that's okay, as long as we submit to you. So Lord, I pray that you would help us all to just begin to have a desire to know you more and more, to go deeper and deeper, to understand you and to live what you've asked us to live better than we ever have. And this morning, if there's anybody here who says, you know what, I just, I want to start my walk with God. You know, I want to start a journey. I want to get to know this guy who, who left the Bible for me. I want to pray with you and where you're, from where you're at. And if there's anyone, if you just want to lift up your hand and say, oh, I want to start that journey. All right, let's see that. Anybody else? And, and maybe it's not your first time starting that journey, but it's, Something you haven't done in a while. That's okay, too. Let's pray. And I'm just going to say a prayer, and in your own heart, just put something like this in your own words. Dear Lord, we thank you so much that you came and died for us, and died for me. And even though I may not understand all the ins and outs of sin and needing you to die, I want to understand that. And I want to start a journey with you, so forgive me of my sins. And walk with me and guide me and show me and bring other people around me that can help me. And we just ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. And God bless you. Hope that you join us on Zoom. The information is on the back of your bulletin, Wednesday night at 7. Um, and then be ready to discuss and ask questions and, and make comments. And we'll discuss those things together as we walk through the New Testament together. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.